All right, great. So he, who here was here yesterday for the keynote? Everybody pretty much, right? And remember Jeff, yeah, Jeff Haney, the CEO of Accelerator, kind of talking about, it seemed to me like, first off, who has, who has ever heard of Accelerator before yesterday? Kind of, sort of, anybody ever used it? So did you feel like it was kind of out of context, like way over your head? Kind of like, hey, here's where we're going. Well, where are you? Well, if you want to know all the background information so that you're totally ready to hear his keynote yesterday, you're in the right spot. So now you can go back in time you can understand what Jeff was saying. I was excited. I was like, wow, that's really cool. And he answered a lot of my questions. I even made a whole new slide while he was talking. Like, here's all the answers to all the questions I wanted. And then I went up and talked to him afterwards. But now you can actually start to kind of go back and go, oh, I think I understand it now. Because we're going to talk about the accelerator framework today. All right, so <clears throat> about me. My name is Vince Molnier. If you're looking for me anywhere at all at any kind of user name and any kind of website, any email address. I'm always be bowling here because I have no competition for that. So I own that everywhere. I live in St. Paul. I grew up here in Minnesota in the Twin Cities, but I went to Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Worcester, Massachusetts because they have really good colleges out east. But then I came right back because those people are just awful and the whole place is awful. No one wants to live there. It's just terrible. I've been a consultant developer since 2005. I started out as a .NET guy, did that for several years, and I'm still doing it, still interested in it and everything, but I started to branch out a few years ago, wanted to do a lot more front-end stuff, wanted to just kind of grow my skills and become a better, well-rounded developer. And then a couple of years ago, I'm like, you know, I really need to get somewhere on this mobile stuff. I didn't want to do, I knew I didn't want to do like iOS development, I didn't want to work with Objective-C, I didn't want to do Java, I'd rather shoot myself in the face. But I said, you know, I really have to do this mobile stuff. So I started looking at cross-platform mobile. Things like Titanium, things like PhoneGap, Xamarin, and tons of other stuff. I went to Brad Marsh's talk, who was right here in the last room, in, in the last session. But I went to his talk at that conference. So really interested in that kind of thing. I'm always looking to improve my skills. More about me. I got married May 4th of 2008, Star Wars Day. Pretty easy to remember. It's not together. It's the exact same day. Same day, same year. Alright. Yep. So if you ever forget when you're when your anniversary is call me or like uh, Twitter, you know, <laughs> like, oh, it's my anniversary, I forgot, I'll tell you. It's usually my wife who forgets. Uh, yeah, yeah. My wife actually said that she, she we kept going back and forth going on it's May fifth or May fourth. And it was always her saying May fifth, but that's not possible. And pull up a calendar, which back we didn't get married on a Monday. Come on now. So anyway. <sighs> Three years ago on July fourth. My wife gave birth to our first kid, uh, my daughter, Zena. And then last month, we and my wife gave birth to our, our son, Felix. Today's agenda. First, we're going to compare native and cross-platform mobile development. Tell about what they are, pros, cons, that kind of thing. Then we're going to talk about Titanium, but we're also going to compare it to PhoneGap and Xamarin. The reason I picked these two technologies is because these are two of the more... Uh, between these three, Titanium, PhoneGap, and Xamarin, these are very different ways of solving the cross-platform solution. They have their own sets of pros and cons, their own times when you want to use one versus the other. Then we're going to go over the Alloy framework, which is kind of a new thing. came about last year. Titanium actually is about five years old, something like that, four or five, something like that. And then a lot of people looked at it and said, yeah, I'm not quite sure about this. Well, Alloy came out at the beginning of last year and really changed the game, made it a lot better. And if you listen to Jeff's talk, Jeff's keynote yesterday, then you know they're looking to make huge strides and become that much more of a player. I pressed the wrong button. All right. Really don't like fanboys. Not a big fan of this kind of idea where you always do the same thing. For example, you know, you talk to the Ember guys that gave Ember talks. It's like everyone always just says, I'm doing a single page application. Ergo, I will use Angular and never look at anything else kind of a terrible approach. And when it comes to mobile development, it's the same way. A lot of people, I, I, I've said it before, I'll say it again, if you look around at this conference, you'll see a lot of that exact same machine. They look exactly the same. It's like there's one Mac. And you get, it looks like you guys are in a cult or something. It's just absolutely crazy. And a lot of people like that, no offense to you guys, unless you are, but a lot of people like that are like, you know what, I'm going to make a mobile application, so I will make an iPhone app. And that is it. That's not, it really shouldn't be your thought process. 
And I think it's even sillier, not because I'm a .NET guy, a lot of people are like, I'm going to make a Windows Phone app. Like, great, you're selling at 2% of the marketplace. Great idea, right guys? Fabulous. When it comes to cross-platform, people are the same way. When I talk to .NET guys, it's the only idea they could ever have is Xamarin. They can't think about anything else. It's not even possible. It's just, I, I hate that idea. Every time you're going to make an application, every time you're going to make a website, I want you to start over from scratch and rethink about what you're going to do and why you should pick whatever framework you're going to pick. So, starting off, native development. It is designed and optimized for a specific device, and the makers of that device are going to support it. So, for example, if you belong to the, to the iOS cult, they want you to make apps for their device. So they will make sure that you have the tools necessary to have a, a positive experience while you're making those devices, right? Makes perfect sense. And of course, Windows Phone, that they tooled that into Visual Studio, so it's very easy to make a Windows Phone app, things like that. And what you end up getting with native development, it, let's say if you want to make an app that works on iPhones, works on Androids, and works in Windows Phone. You're going to have what's called the silo approach. You're going to have three entirely separate teams working on with entirely different kinds of technologies and entirely different IDEs to make the exact same app. That's kind of cost ineffective, right? Across platform, you have one code base that works for more than one platform, whether that's iOS and or Android and or Windows Phone or Blackberry, whatever else it is. The idea is that you have one code base and it works for two or more platforms, depending on the framework. So which one should you choose? Of course, you absolutely, I've done all the research for you, you shouldn't think about it, don't even come up with your own conclusions, I'm completely infallible. <coughs> Obviously not. Should, I think, personally, I would suggest using native when you need 100% native experience all the time. In no way, shape, or form can you accept less than native experience because this app is too important. If you need to access the absolute most obscure device features that only exist in one platform versus another, that kind of thing. If you're only going to target one platform, if everybody, if it's an internal app and you know everyone's going to use an iPad, maybe you should just make an iPad app and not worry about doing cross-platform, that kind of thing. Also, if money is absolutely no issue, if you're working for a giant conglomerate corporation, you're working for, you know, Cargill or. 3M or something like that, and they're like, look, this app is super duper important to us. This is going to drive billions of dollars of sales, and if we blow this, or if we have a, a suboptimal experience, our competitors are going to start taking our market share of online sales. So we don't care what the price tag is. That's the case. Just go ahead, do name. Don't worry about cross-platform. Go ahead with your silos. It's okay if it costs you another quarter of a million dollars, because it's really important, right? I would suggest using cross-platform of some kind, if you don't need full device access, because you're like, well, I just need to look at the contacts, or I just need to take a picture, or if you have any form of restriction to your budget whatsoever. How limited? Well, that is going to drive what framework you end up using. So first, we'll start with PhoneGap. PhoneGap, free, open source framework. You get to use whatever IDE you want. You know, if you're doing, if you're doing, uh, if, you, if you work on a Mac, you got Xcode. Go ahead and use it. No big deal. You use Visual Studio, you're a .NET guy, keep using it. No big deal. You use Sublime Text, whatever, doesn't matter. There's nothing special. You can go ahead and use whatever you want. You use HTML, CSS, JavaScript, which means you have a lot of people that can help you with your app. A lot of people know how, what that is. You, if, you, if you can make websites, you can make a phone gap app. Very, very simple to learn. And the API will allow you access to the most common device features. Solometer, camera, microphone, file system, a few more. I think there are eight namespaces. The most common things you're going to use. And if there's something that's missing on one of the platforms, you can make a, a module real quick in the native language, and you can actually import that very easily. How does it work? First, you create your local website. It's a, it's a website. That's what it is. And you locally install it on the machine. Then you have a tiny little thin phone gap JavaScript wrapper. Very, very quick, very, very easy to learn, very simple. And that website is hosted in a native web browser. So whatever the, web the native web browser is for the device, you're hosting this locally installed website. And then the, the only little other little piece is the phone gap device API, which is an actual native wrapper around 
your app that hosts the native web browser, and it's listening for the events that get fired by the phone gap JavaScript API, and will interact with the actual device based on whatever it is you're calling. Pretty simple. Cons, well, API support varies depending on your device. And something might not actually be supported properly. HTML says so JavaScript, great, but that's all you get. And not really native apps, they're just locally installed websites. And I would say that the most serious apps, the more serious your app gets, the more obvious it becomes that it's not native. So what should you use it? Best news is your developers, if you can write a website, you can make a phone gap app. Very simple. Right now you can do it very easily. If you have a really small budget, if you have a really uncomplicated app, it is much, much, much faster to develop a phone gap app than anything else. Native, it's like orders of magnitude. Even the other cross-platform solutions that might be faster than native, but not as fast as PhoneGap. Maybe if you're just trying to start mobile development, you're not, you're not quite, you're just trying to test it out, see what kind of things you have to consider when you're making apps for different kinds of platforms, that sort of thing. It's not the, it's not best for the largest, the most complicated apps, but best good news is your app probably doesn't fall into that category. You're like, oh, I want a good app. You can make a good app in PhoneGap, don't worry about it. It's okay. It won't have a native look and feel because it isn't a native app. Xamarin, that's on the other, other end of the spectrum. Xamarin tries to get as close to native as possible. First off, you get to use C Sharp code. Great, awesome. That means you can land as a generic link and all the other cool stuff you used to do in the .NET world, right? Great, fantastic. And it compiles to a native binary. Instruction language plus just-in-time compiling for Android and an ARM binary plus ahead-of-time compiling for iOS. So it's really fully top to bottom, 100% native. Great. Fantastic performance, really good. Notice at the top, I put past tense, how Xamarin work. When it first came out, basically the idea was you have all your, all your logic in a cross-platform PCL or whatever kind of library you want to use. Then you have a separate, a separate project for each front-end platform and each device API. So in PhoneGap, you might say, I'm going to make up the namespace and APIs. In PhoneGap, you might say navigator.camera.takeapicture. Well, in, and that would take a picture on any device. In Xamarin, you would have to say uh, Xamarin.camera, or Xamarin.ios.camera.takeapicture, Xamarin.android.camera.takeapicture, that kind of thing. Make sense? So you can't just say, take a picture. You have to say specifically, Oh, I'm on an iPhone, iPhone take a, camera, take a picture. Oh, I'm on Android, Android take a picture. And then for the UIs, you actually, you actually had to have a separate Android user interface, separate Windows, separate Mac, separate whatever. So you're kind of like, well, that kind of defeats the purpose of cross-platform, doesn't it? Aren't I supposed to write this once and it's supposed to work everywhere? Well, they're saying it's kind of a good thing because user interfaces are kind of hard and you kind of want to make sure that they look exactly the same or they don't look exactly the same. You want them to look the way that the native app is supposed to look on that platform. Originally, Xamarin said you needed to have a separate device API and separate UI, right? They talked about this idea, lowest common denominator, LCD. Oh, this is the worst thing in the world. That's the way they were pushing it, and that's what a lot of people say. If you look up anything about Titanium, and whenever anybody says anything native about it, they talk about lowest common denominator. It's a real thing, it exists, but it is way overblown. Right? And what that is, is if you want to put a button on a page or a, a screen and you say, okay, put a button on there. If it's going to be cross-platform UI, it's going, to, it's going to have to be interpreted as, oh, what does a button mean for iPhone? Oh, it's an iPhone button. What does a button mean for Windows? Oh, a Windows button. Okay. But they're not exactly the same thing. And sometimes those objects really aren't even that close. Buttons, pretty obvious. Labels, they're to be the same across the board, but sometimes they start to deviate a little bit. And sometimes their properties and their methods that deviate a little bit. So sometimes you kind of go, well, okay, we'll include this method, but if you try to run it on Android, it's not going to work. Or if you try to put this kind of UI control on an iPhone, it's not going to work. You're going to get in there. So you have to be a little bit careful, that kind of thing. Sometimes they just say, look, they're nothing similar at all. We're not even going to try. You, you just don't have access to that. You'll have to post the strings to get that to work. That's pretty rare. So I took this slide from Miguel de Acosta, who got up in front of you know 100 billion trillion people online and everything, and he gave this example of what he he was basically talking about: phone gap and titanium. 
and it says you take your CSS, HTML, JavaScript, ActionScript, whatever it is, and you put it in this magic box, and it will poop out terrible apps, basically what it said. It's like, so that's his idea of wrapping up anything other than Xamarin, including PhoneGap and Titanium. But just a couple months later, they changed their mind. Now, Xamarin.Mobile is a little bit older. It's an abstraction of the device API. So that means you can use contacts, camera, geolocation. They're planning on notifications and accelerometer, and they're probably going to need more. So that means all of a sudden it starts to work like PhoneGap. So you can say, camera, take a picture, and it'll figure out iPhone, Android, that kind of thing. Kind of going back on what they said. And guess what? Just a couple months after he got up and told everybody, don't do that. Don't do cross-platform UIs. That's dumb. They came out with Xamarin.Form, which is cross-platform UIs. Interesting. And totally full of it, right? Hey, LCD, don't worry about it. It's no big deal anymore. We think it's cool now. And this is just a list. I'm not going to go over the of Xamarin talk of all the different kinds of things that you can use that will work across all three platforms that Xamarin will develop for. So the cons of Xamarin. Basic Xamarin Studio is free. It's also totally useless. They actually have a limit for the max size for your app. Can anybody guess what that is? If you know what I'll tell you, don't say it. Take a guess. The max size of the app in the free version of Xamarin Studio. Come on, speak up. Anyway. 64K. Uh, you know exactly what it is. <laughs> 64K. You can't do a whole lot with 64K, can you? No. So a, a Xamarin fanboy said, no, you can do a ton with 64K. I was like, really? Pulled my phone, looked at the smallest app, 144K. And it was system information. That's it. What? Don't try to tell me that you can do anything with 64K. Totally pointless, totally useless. You have to pay. And when you start paying, the paid version of Xamarin Studio is $300 per person, per year, per platform. So if you want to develop for iPhone and Android, $600 per person per year. And if you want Visual Studio support, it's $1,000 per person per platform. It starts to get pretty pricey pretty quickly. Of course, if you're saving a lot of development time, that'll take care of it. But the point is, it's not cheap. So when should you use Xamarin? If you want absolutely as close to native as possible, there's no, no, no cross-platform framework that's going to beat Xamarin. It is going to be as close as you can get to fully native functionality and performance. If you're a .NET shop, well, get, the learning curve is a lot lower. And you get to use all your Visual Studio plugins that you've always used, that kind of thing. And if you got some money to spend, it's going to be a lot faster than native development, but it's not going to be as fast as PhoneGap, and you're going to have to have some licensing issues. So it's going to cost a little bit. All right, Accelerator. Accelerator is the company that have, that uses Titanium as the development studio. All right. Anyway, so you build apps using JavaScript, much like PhoneGap. Pretty cool. But it actually compiles to a real app, like Xamarin. Wow, this is amazing. Like leprechauns and unicorns and rainbows. This is the best thing ever, right? Best of both worlds. You have robust access to the device APIs. In PhoneGap, you can add eight namespaces. In Titanium, you get 32. So the, you're not going to find much that isn't covered by Titanium. Titanium Studio is free. And it's actually useful. You can actually use it and make a real fully functional app, and it's not going to suck. It's great. There's no limit. You, can, you have full functionality, full access to everything to make an app. You don't have to get Accelerator at that. All right. So how does Titanium work? You take your JavaScript, your kind of sort of XML, and kind of sort of CSS, we'll get to that in a minute. Turn it, you give it to Titanium Studio and say, get me some apps. And it gives you, this is the magic box, right? And it gives you your iPhone app and your Android app. What's this? Plus JavaScript, but that's not about. Well, it's kind of a unique way of doing cross-platform stuff. What it does is it makes the fully native shell UI stuff where the, the buttons are real buttons and everything's real. But once you do something, once you say, hey, I want you to do something, then, it, then what it does, they call it native land and JavaScript land. So the native land says, whoa, they want me to do something. So then you jump over to JavaScript land in the native JavaScript engine. Titanium literally runs up the native JavaScript engine and says, hey, you do all the work for me. So it doesn't compile the JavaScript to anything. It doesn't turn it into an instruction language or an R binary like Xamarin does. It just hands it off to the JavaScript engine and says, you figure it out. When you're done, let me know. Then it figures everything out, goes makes your web call, does the processing, and then it comes back to native land and says, hey, here's the results. Here's that, here's that information you wanted. 
kind of a novel approach. And it's pretty easy as far as your JavaScript is going to be what gets run. That's the real JavaScript that's run. Cons to Titanium? Hmm. Shared user interfaces? Going to have a bad time. It's not fun. There are things that, after every once in a while when you're working with Titanium, I, I did a contract with Titanium and it was like, every once in a blue moon we'd come across something, we'd come across that LCD problem, and we'd run into an issue where they say, hey, we want this kind of control to look like this across all the different, across iOS and Android and the mobile web version, that kind of thing. And we'd say, okay, we, we'd work on it. The iPhone one would pop out real quick or the Android one would look really good like that. You know, everything would do exactly what we wanted it to do. And then sometimes we go, oh, but the other one doesn't look anything, it, it didn't take your styles that we tried to add to it. That's weird. It looks okay, it looks fine, but it doesn't quite look like your, your mock-up here. And they're like, no, spend all day making that button look exactly like we put in our mock-up. I'm like, but it doesn't matter. Nobody actually cares about that. But it doesn't look like the mock-up. I can't think. Basically, don't fight it. Don't make your UIs identical. Don't fight with titanium. It's Sisyphean, right? It's like pushing a rock up a hill. Don't do that. Rely on the native look and feel. Once you start feeling like you're pulling teeth, stop and say, look, they intentionally didn't work on this because an iPhone app is supposed to look like an iPhone app. It's not supposed to look like an Android app. Android is supposed to look like Android. It's not supposed to look like an iPhone app, right? So try to rely on that native look and feel. Once you feel like you're like you're pulling teeth, just give up. Just quit because everything's fine. No one's going to care anyway. Except your the guy that wrote your mock-up. Right, device support. Like, uh, it's not that not that big of an issue. It's more like really, really hardcore fine-tuned styling. What I ended up finding out, what, what it seemed like people were doing was they were like, it's like they're trying to build a, a website. You know what I mean? Like with CSS, you can style anything, do whatever you want. And I'm like, you're making this look more webby than native -y. Like that's not what titanium is about. It's supposed to look and feel very native, right? All right, device support. Titanium is first class citizen, or iOS is a first class citizen, right? So it seems like they have I iPhone is their number one target. Android, secondary. For the most part, it's pretty equivalent, but generally you can tell that there's a little bit more functionality in iPhones than Android. Mobile web, you can actually have, you can use the same code and it will make a website for you, like a mobile website version. Pretty cool, except I would call it the redheaded stepchild of Titanium, but that would be an insult to redheaded stepchildren. So I'll show you a mobile website in a, in a little bit here. <laughs> You'll get cheap to see how crappy they are. But anyway, in general, like, I really wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it. I mean, it's supposed to be a native, you're supposed to be making native apps anyway. In general, I kind of don't recommend using mobile web. Maybe just try phone app for that one. Windows Phone. Ah, uh, jeez, I don't know. All, all last year, they're like, oh, we're going to have it in the second half of 2013. Second half comes, no updates, none whatsoever. Very recently, I looked it up because I was like, is this still accurate? I mean, it's been several more months. And they have a strange thing where it's like, Okay, I told you the mobile web sucked, right? Anybody here heard of the WinJS or anything like that? WinJS? Oh, okay, a couple people. Just raise your hand so I can actually see. Jeez, man, come on. All right, so what they're doing is they're, okay, so WinJS, they have a universal cross-platform within Microsoft, that is, like Windows Phone and Windows 8 apps. And you can write this thing, you can use this thing called WinJS to create your apps to do it. So what they're doing is they, they're, taking the mobile web version of Titanium and converting that to WinJS and making that a, a, a universal Windows app. So it's like a bastard. Oh, you have to use the command line for that, too. You can't do it out of Titanium Studio. So you have a bastardization of a bastardization of your app. I don't recommend it. Not there yet. But Jeff said yesterday, I got to update my slide, 9 to 12 months. Finally, I have Windows Phone support. Okay. In Tie.net. Tizen. Anybody heard of Tizen? Yeah, no, not really, huh? Anybody? Nope. Nope. Huh? Yeah, I heard the name. 
They're like, yeah, let's bring that out. Let's start. There's more support for Tizen than Windows Phone. Whoa, what's Tizen? Well, Tizen, you're, you're going to see that. Maybe something like this right here with this little thing here. Like tablets and kiosk type stuff. Things you might find at a register or something. You know, like I'm going to order my chilies at my, my table or whatever it is. That kind of thing. A lot of tablets and phones and or, uh, watches, that sort of thing. Things in your car. A lot of them use Tizen. TVs, that kind of thing. And I, I asked Jeff yesterday, I was like, why did you do that? Like, who was giving you, somebody must have gave you money. And you said Samsung and Intel were giving the money, but then they kind of put Tizen on the back burner. So, so did Titanium. They said, you let us know when you're ready. All right, so when should you use it? If, you're web, if you have strong web developers, or if, you're web, if your developers are familiar with Eclipse, because of this, uh, Titanium Studio is a flavor of Eclipse, so if you're very familiar with Eclipse, this would be a good fit for you. If you like the idea of PhoneGap, but it's just not going to quite do it, not going to quite cut it for you, you need a much more native, you know, native quality, higher end look and feel, that kind of thing. If you have a decent budget, bigger than, you know, bigger than PhoneGap, but not big enough to do Xamarin or, or fully native, but you need a high quality app with a native look and feel. Titanium is a good fit for you. If you're ready to sacrifice a little bit of UI control, if you have totally hardcore, crazy weirdo, designer people that won't give an inch, well, okay, fine. You're going to spend a week working on a button. Great. And I, uh, for a long time, I've been looking for just various, something to help me kind of get this point home to people. Like, you have to you have to work on deciding what framework to use. Like I was saying, don't be a fanboy. Don't say, I'm going to do phone app for everything. I'm going to do Xamarin for everything. I'm going to do native iOS for everything. <laughs> You have to start from scratch and decide with each individual app that you're going to make what framework and what direction you should go. And I couldn't really find anything like that, so I just decided to make one. At that uh, bit.ly link there, that is case sensitive, by the way. I'm going to open it up. Go over here. Or that guy right there. All right, so we're not going to go over it too long, of course. All right, I want an app. Do I really need an app? Uh, well, actually, I don't need device. I don't need to talk to the device at all. So maybe you should just go ahead and make a responsive website. No big deal. Okay, I need an app, but actually, I need a game. I'm not really an expert. I don't know. Talk to somebody else. I Unity. I don't know. Whatever. Okay, now for real, we're in. We're in. We're, we're actually going to make an app. Okay. Yes, I need an app. I need to talk to the device. Blah blah blah. Okay, do I have a practically unlimited budget? Why, yes, I do. Just go native, don't worry about it. No, actually, we're not super giant, evil, multinational corporation. Is it unreasonable to expect that your, your developers are going to be able to learn a new technology? Yes, they're all morons. Okay, what is their expertise? Yeah, they're all .NET guys. Just use Xamarin. Don't worry about it. Just don't, don't even try to shoehorn them in. All right, uh, you know what? They're, they're not really good at C Sharp, but they're good web developers. Do they use Eclipse? Yeah. Okay, just use Titanium. No, they've never used uh, Eclipse before. Is your budget really, really limited? Yes, it is. Use PhoneGap. That kind of thing. I'm not going to go over every single option, but the, the idea is hopefully you can go there, start from there, and there's a discuss link at the bottom for you to give feedback, that kind of thing. Just the, I, I want to build this and make this a little bit more you know, friendly and more complete. Okay, they don't know web stuff, they don't know C sharp. What do they know? Oh, they know Java. Anybody heard of Codename One? No, we're not gonna talk about it much. Lua. Oh, I can use Corona. Great, wonderful. Well that's that. I'm not gonna click on everything. Just the tool I was looking for for a long time. Okay. We've we've heard all these different philosophies and theories and you've given us tons of information about all these different things. You know what? Can you just like insult our intelligences and patronize us a little bit, give us some smiley faces or something? I got you covered. Don't worry. All right. So here's a comparison. In general, if you look on the right-hand side for the native, I don't, I don't mean to denigrate it. I'm just being honest. From anything involving cost or development, it is by far the worst. But when it comes to performance, it is the best. No question, hands down. That might be the only thing you care about. And if that's the only thing you care about, there you go. Stick with native. PhoneGap is the exact opposite, really. For the most part, it's the best at everything. Except, whoops, definitely the worst in performance. 
It's the same as a website, but you don't have to go across the wire. So it's going to be a little bit faster, a little bit more responsive than an actual website, but in general, it's going to behave like a website. Xamarin, uh, a little more performant, and it's going to cost a little bit more. Yeah, but Titanium, all across the board, pretty darn good. Never the best, never bad. It's always pretty good. Pretty easy to develop, pretty cheap, pretty easy to find talent because it's mainly JavaScript, right? That kind of thing. So in general, it's, from those kinds of perspectives, it's a pretty good option. So definitely keep it in your tool belt, even if you don't use it very much. All right, Alloy Framework. So like I said, five years ago when it first came out, it was all JavaScript. Anybody ever tried to make like DOM elements in JavaScript? Kind of rotten, right? That's the way it used to be with Titanium. You always had to put every single element on the screen with JavaScript. Like, I'm going to add a window. I'm going to open the window. I'm going to put a view in there. I'm going to put a table in there. I'm going to put a label. That you could, there was no front end. Then, at the beginning of last year, they came up with the, what they call the Alloy Framework, Titanium Alloy. And that's basically an MVC framework for Titanium. Built on top of Backbone JS, so if you use that, you'd be very, it'd be a very quick learning curve to get into Alloy. It definitely promotes separation of concerns in comparison to what they did before. And we use, like I said, kind of sort of XML and kind of sort of CSS. Anybody ever, well, first off, I'm sure we've all done, dealt with the Wisdom stuff, right? Pretty ugly XML, right? Anybody ever done XAML? All right. XAML is a little bit cleaner. It's .NET, Silverlight, WPF, Windows Phone, that kind of thing. A little bit cleaner than regular XML, right? A little bit easier to understand. I would say that Alloy's XML is even cleaner and easier to see, read than that. In fact, it reads a little bit more like HTML. You can use IDs and classes. It kind of reads like an XML or, or an HTML thing, which takes right over that kind of sort of CSS. They call it TSS, F for Titanium Style Sheets. I thought they should have gone with accelerator style sheets, but I guess they didn't like that act as well. And you can reference things like IDs and classes, and you can even, if you ever seen like input where type equals label that or you know text sort of thing in your CSS, you can use attribute based stuff in your CSS as well, TSS, to pick a particular platform. Like, okay, so this thing only exists on an iPhone, not an Android. So only show it on an iPhone, and you would you would actually literally put that right in your TSS. It's easier to scale, maintain, test that kind of thing. So you can make much more serious apps. A lot of people before would just slap everything in you know one or two JavaScript files. Now it's going to parse things out quite a bit better. And I'm going to look over some go over some code with you. Go over a horrible demo, and just to show you just how bad the mobile web version is, I would pull up the. Of course, this is a, a Windows machine, which means I can't pull up the iPhone simulator. If I had the iPhone simulator, I would just run that. No problem. It's pretty cool, right? And I'm not going to pull up the the Android emulator because if you ever use that, you probably recover from cancer shortly thereafter, and you, you know it's just the worst thing in the world. I'm never going to rely on. I've done it before in a talk, and I'm just like, oh, freaking work, please, please, please. And I'm just like restarting it in the background while I'm talking for 10 minutes. And I'm just like, come on, please work. So I'm not going to rely on it. We're just going to do the mobile web version, because the mobile web version works, and by the way, works very quickly. So uh, let's see. Oh, wait a minute. I can't. i got to do this and like that and like that. And I'm pulled into Titanium Studio. So here's Titanium Studio. You notice it's a flavor of Eclipse. I notice one other thing. It's a little bit off to the side. There you go. Better? I just made a conference lineup app of all the talks. No big deal. And so here's an XML file, pretty simple. If you notice, it, it kind of reads, it looks like it's really reading more like an HTML file. You still have the XML kind of, the tags, everything, but if you look here, you have like uh, class, container, and ID, session table zero, that kind of thing. Pretty interesting. You can, you can put things like background color and whatever, you can put that all in here if you want, but it's a really good idea to separate your concerns so that you can hand off your TSS style sheet to a designer and say, hey, run with this. And you can pretty much copy, pretty much, copy, paste your CSS into a TSS if somebody is good with that. 
the, the uh, any any questions on the XML before we switch over to TSS or anything? If you notice here, we have you have to start with alloy, and then you show a window with a tab group. And I have two tabs at the bottom. We'll show, look at that in a minute, and it's going to say you know you click on one button for the session lineup for yesterday, another button for the lineup from yesterday or from today. Let me just show it to you here. So here's this, and it kind of behaves like a mobile app here, kind of weird, but really ugly and stupid. There are those icons, and here's the session from today, that kind of thing. All right. Well, of course, you couldn't see that whole thing, could you? But anyway, so there's the XML. And you're like, wow, that's pretty tight. Not very much. This is your whole front end for the whole thing? <clears throat> yeah, that was it. For the style sheet, look at that next. If you look, I have IDs. I didn't put anything in there, but I put I put something in there just to show you. And you can use the dot syntax for a class. One thing to think about, like I said, you couldn't, you can't for sure just copy CSS into TSS because this isn't actually a CSS file. If you look at the nomenclature and the way it's structured, it's actually a like I have to put in I have to put it in quotes instead of just dot container because this is actually a JSON file. This is read like JSON. So you can imagine this as having one more, I don't know, maybe like a, like a, an array, a, a square bracket before and after, and think of it as like a list of styles that gets interpreted. It's not quite CSS. A couple other cool things to think about is uh, right here we have color. Wait a minute, what's this all about? Prop what, properties? Constants? What's that? You can you you're not bound to just you know pound zero zero two four whatever. Over here in the global file, you can put a ton of stuff in the contract where I was on. Yeah, I mean this is a couple hundred lines long. It imported other files, that kind of thing. But I put one global property in here called the Vikings Purple, and this is the purple I got off the NFL.com website that is actually the Vikings Purple. And that was that the label at the top over here that's in purple. Then over here, see this right here, with TI UI size. Remember Jeff was saying T, uh, TI is short for titanium, so you have to type that out. And th these are just globals. In fact, that's the default. I only put that on there just to show you, but it's actually default. The default is you know, full width and full height. For, for the, the child controller will take up the entirety of the parent controller if you don't list it. Any questions on the TSS part here? Pretty straightforward, pretty easy to pick up. Not so The learning curve is going to be extremely shallow. Your JavaScript can be the same kind of thing you've done before, CSS, very, very, very similar to your other CSS, and XML looks a lot like HTML, that kind of thing. Here's the Thai app editor. This is kind of like, have you ever made like an Android manifest file or something? Yeah, gross, right? Well, this is basically what this is, only it's in configuration form. And if you notice, down here, if you want to target Android, BlackBerry, Mobile Web, you just check them, and it'll just build a new version for you. I'm going to go ahead and build the mobile web version. If you look over here, you'll see mobile web preview and browser. You can pull that down and change what you want to build here, that kind of thing. And I'm going to just, I'm going to build it, although I have the, the Julia Child finished thing already pulled up. But just to show you how fast it is, it goes down there, builds and stuff, and look, three seconds to build it. Got your little splash screen, and then you get your conference light up. All right, let's see here. Um, let's see, is there anything else I want to show on here? And, and before I jump back to the slides, is there anything anybody wanted to see more of, or any questions anybody has as far as development is concerned? XML, TSS, JavaScript, anything. Well, actually, we didn't even look at the JavaScript file. All right. All right. Uh, this is actually from that conference there, back in uh, over at Wisconsin Dells. All right, so session lineup. Don't worry about that. I basically took the... They didn't have an API for Midwest JS. They had an API for that conference, but they didn't have one for Midwest JS, so I parsed the HTML for five minutes. The last night it was pretty ugly, but I got it. It works. And there's one thing, like I said, it's built on Backbone, so 
there is something you can say alloy.create model or or um, there you can create a collection as well. And what you do is this right here, session layout, it, it uses anybody know a common JS, require JS, that kind of thing. What it will do is it will pull in session lineup from the models directory, which you look over here. I have a model called session lineup, and it will look for something called that. You don't have to put JS on it, it will just look for that, and it will load that object, and then anything you put here, you, it, this is optional, but anything you put here, which is of course all this JSON here, maybe you would put that as the result of a call to an API or something like that, hint, hint, or maybe you read it from a database, whatever it is. Whatever you put in here, it will parse into the backbone models for you. Make sense? Pretty easy. I put that there just to show you what it is, but I'm not actually going to use that. <laughs> Skipping right to just the JSON because that's all I need. It's JavaScript, I can work with JSON just fine. And it's not complicated enough. It's not a complicated enough model for backbone. Backbone is better for MVC type stuff. I'm not calling anything to go get it and I'm not saving anything with it. But you can with, with Alloy. Wraps it up in the backbone. And we definitely did that on my contract I had before. Right, parse through for each day. We're going to, uh, each day has time slots and each time slot has a bunch of sessions. And so we put in a header, we go session table, day index. So that means zero or one, because there are two days. So session table zero and one, if you look over here, that's what I put as IDs over here. So with JavaScript, I, I literally, I, I did the same thing you would for, I mean, as if that were just an object. The dollar sign is, kind, I mean, it's not jQuery, but it kind of acts like it, in the sense that you would say dollar sign dot, Without using the brackets, just saying dollar sign dot session table zero will get you that object. So, so if that's just the JavaScript object, I said, well, just go ahead and do this. Make a bracket and say session table plus zero. And append a section, create table view section where the header is the time. Notice that over here. Uh, well, you can't see that. Better. There's the time there, there, and for each of the time slots, spit out each of the sessions in their own row with their own view, and each view has its own label. And it, uh, so the reason why I kind of did this instead of just plopping it all in the XML is to show you that when it comes to things like going out and getting stuff from the server, well, you can still do the JavaScript the painful, you know, slightly more painful uh, creation of labels and adding things in like you would uh, in adding things in the dot. So it still works, and sometimes you still need to do that just like you do in normal JavaScript. And the same kind of mechanisms and skills you've built up doing that on the web take over, convert over very well to titanium. Any more questions now? Yeah. That's about it. I actually opened the window. What a little trick that's just kind of annoying. Hey, put that in there. Hey, okay. I didn't have any time for that. Zangy UI. <laughs> All right, so the accelerator, the accelerator API. Like I said, there are 32 namespaces: accelerometer, file system, geolocation, gestures, media, network, platform stuff, and the OS info, and all the UI stuff. Whatever. 32 namespaces, tons of stuff. Don't worry, you can do it in Titanium. Not a problem. You don't have to worry about it like you might in PhoneGap. You don't have to go roll your own stuff like you might do it in PhoneGap. It works. It's good. Modules. Modules are a collection of files that you can use in different apps. So you want to reuse some code, you make a module. Accelerator has a lot. You can go download some stuff for free. There's a community. You can buy some things from a ton of people, that kind of thing. If you want to do something, check to see if somebody's already done it on Accelerator with Titanium before. Some are device specific. Like sometimes you're like, hey, how come I can't do that in Android? Cool. Look to see if you can find a module for it. You can make your own modules, obviously. You can resell them, you can make a bunch of money, sell the modules, whatever. You do have to do all JavaScript, though. Kind of like the old school Titanium. No Alloy, XML, no TSS, no cool stuff like that. Widgets, it's a little bit, uh, I'm kind of shortcutting them a little bit, but they're kind of like Alloy modules. 
So they're really usable with collection files. You can use them in different projects and stuff like that. But you get use out of life, which means you have XML, TSS, that kind of thing. And they have their own separate MDC directories. And it's a lot more, it's a lot easier to work with them because you can just work with them. You can manipulate them directly. They're just going to be a lot easier to work with and follow along with. All right, so getting started. Like I said, Titanium Studio is based off of a flavor of Eclipse. I'm sure you've all heard of Eclipse having 500 million different versions. Titanium Studio is a very professional version built on top of it. If you ever heard of Aptana Studio, that's a version of Eclipse that is customized for the web. So they added support for Ruby, Python, and PHP, and very customized for web development. And Titanium's like, well, we want it to be like web development. We want it to work like you're making a phone gap app. We want to do it really cool and make it really fun to work with. But we're going to customize it for cross-platform mobile. We're going to add the Titanium SDK so that it can build the different kinds of apps. And, well, we're going to remove all that support for Ruby, Python, PHP. We're going to do, undo your work. Here. But, it's, uh, as you saw, I showed you that IDE before. It works pretty well. For good version of Eclipse. Accelerator Studio. It's an upgraded version of Titanium Studio. Like I said, up to, everything I've talked about up to this point is 100% free. We built an enterprise app for a large company that happens to be located at the second largest building in the state, just down the road a little bit. And the client was the company that owns the building. So very large client, very large enterprise flagship app for their system. Their Android app and their iPhone app sucked hard, like really hard, really bad. So they're like, well, we should redo them. But then they're like, well, we should just do Titanium while we're at it. They're going to do Windows support the second half of 2013, right? <laughs> so. They're okay with it because they didn't have a Windows Phone app anyway. They'll, they'll just wait and they'll compile to the Windows Phone when it's done. Anyway, so Accelerator Studio adds a lot, but it also costs a lot. Up to this point, everything is free. Now, you have to start paying. And Live View, Profile, like Cloud Services, Test Performance Analytics, tons of stuff. Now, how much are you paying for this? Kind of a pretty penny. Like I said, similar like Xamarin. With Xamarin, you can't do anything until you pay money. With Accelerator, you can do a lot, but if you really want to have a flagship, top-of-the-line app, you know, with uh, all the analytics and everything you need, okay, it's going to go from zero to a thousand dollars per user per month, and you have to buy five. So zero to five thousand dollars a month. Personally, I think this is a big problem, and they should address that, and they should have many tiers of pricing. For example, I think that developers will really like Live View. I'm going to put that first. They don't act like it's the most important thing. I do, because it's freaking cool. We're going to go reach these one by one. Here's a screenshot of Live View. So you, you run your, if I had Live View right now, I could run a simulator that actually works and is really quick, right? And it, it wouldn't suck. And then, as soon as I change anything, I change this label, I change this background from red to blue, as soon as I hit save, boom, instantaneous feedback. I would kill for that. When I did my, our project on my contract, I was using a, a, Win, a Windows machine. We had one guy working on a Mac, and he got to actually have a good development experience because he got to use the iPhone simulator, which is a dream. I gave up on the Android emulator, and I would just deploy it to my phone to test things. That's how bad it was. Anyway, so Live View would save you anywhere from like 10 minutes a day if you're an iPhone guy, or like an hour a day if you're an Android guy, or, or a, a Windows guy. And that would be worth a lot of money. Maybe they should package things, I would package like, I would have a developer package where you have like Live View and a couple other things, and have like a business analytic type package. So then you'd have like, and you wouldn't have to, a minimum of five licenses. You would have one guy paying 200 bucks a month to develop, another guy paying $300 a month to get all the analytics, another guy doing all the testing stuff, paying a couple hundred dollars a month, and then you'd actually have people adopting these. I don't know. Personally, I just think it's a really bad idea uh, for what they've done because the, the platform is really good. It brings a lot of cool tools. Here's Profiler. It will uh, help you profile your code and bring, show you a bunch of performance bottlenecks, that kind of thing, so you can make your app a lot more performant. Cloud services. All the things that you have to go and buy from eight different companies or different kind of open source stuff, whatever, 
you just get it with that filler platform and they're very high end, very enterprisey, very, very high quality. You're probably not going to be buying anything better anyway. So if you do need all these things, then all of a sudden the platform begins, becomes to be a pretty good deal. Push notifications, you know, check-ins, database, storage, blah, blah, blah. All right, testing, automated functional testing. You can tell it, click here, swipe this, drag that, and they're re-executable. So every time you do something, you run these, make sure that your app still performs the way it's supposed to perform. Pretty cool. Performance. How is your app performing? How are, why are people experiencing crashes, that kind of thing? You have this cool dashboard that will help you figure all that out. Analytics, this is huge. Uh, not only to figure out you know, how well your app is performing, but you get to figure out what people are doing. When somebody clicks on something, where are they spending all their time? Are they looking at this one feature? Then you can kind of figure out, hmm, maybe since people seem to focus on these particular features, we should focus all our development time there. Or maybe people aren't going to this other feature because it's terrible and we need to make that better. That kind of thing. So it really helps you engage with your customers without even trying to get direct feedback with them. All right, this is the slide I got to add because of Jeff talking yesterday. Tie.net, so that's the next version of Titanium. They, he talked about this Hyperloop thing. Jeff talked about it yesterday during his keynote, and he was talking about how you know you get to use the, you get to like pull in the native APIs and sort of a common JS type thing, and it's going to have improved performance because they're trying to. You're not going to have that giant load up. He was saying there's a whole bunch of stuff comes with on. Uh, it's kind of like piggyback on your app for actually making it work. A lot of them, they're trying to cut that down as much as possible. It's going to be more performance, it's going to run a lot faster, that kind of thing. And they're really for real, totally for real this time, going to have Windows Phone support. So if you want to sell and publish to that 3% of the market, you can do that now, finally, awesome. And it'll just be given to you right out of the box. All right, conclusions. Accelerator is an established framework. It's been around for five years, or early 2009, late 2009, something like that. It can give you a native look and feel. You're going to get a native app. It's not a phone gap thing. It's not somewhere between. It's not an HTML5 website or anything like that. And in Tie.next, it's going to be getting closer and closer and closer with more and more native functionality, where you're offshoring to true native functionality instead of always working in JavaScript, right? So it's going to be a pretty highly, pretty, pretty high performance app. It's not going to be quite as good as Xamarin or quite as good as native but it's very performant, doesn't have a lot of the same issues that a phone gap app might have. And one thing to think about, not only can it provide a native look and feel, please rely on it. Don't pull teeth. Don't make your buttons goofy. Developers need to drag some of those UI decisions, that whole lowest common denominator thing. Once you get to a point, if you think it's just a little too much of a problem, go back to your PM, go back to your VA and say, enough's enough, we're done. It looks the way it looks. It's going to be good. You can reuse the vast majority of your code, like 90 plus percent, instead of you know 60 or 70, like with Xamarin, maybe 80 if you're lucky, that kind of thing. You can reuse the absolute vast majority of your code. The only things you can't reuse are things that really just don't exist on the other platforms. If something exists in iOS but doesn't exist in Android, well, you don't get to reuse that code. You're going to have to say, well, if it's on iOS, I'm going to do this. If it's on Android, I'm going to do something either different or faking that kind of functionality, that kind of thing. And it's a good fit for web developers because it's built for that. So if you like the idea of building a phone cap app because of how easy it would be, Titanium would still fit that bill. It's a good fit for web developers and really good fit for Eclipse users because you're basically using Eclipse. So anybody have any questions? Again, softball is only, so keep it easy. Yep. Yeah, about the, so the pay versus the free aspect. Yep. It looks like any of that stuff would really be defined uh, free or uh, very inexpensive. Yep. Each of those individual pieces, like, let's say you look at it and you're like, oh, I like those three things or whatever. I wouldn't recommend buying the platform. Well, they actually sell it at $5,000 a minute. Yeah, they do. They yeah. do to very large clients. Yeah. Like, you could, uh, after that $5,000 mark, then it drops down to 250 per, per person. But you wouldn't even need to do that. After you buy that original 5000 everyone else would just use the free version. You can have your one tester. You know, your, your BA can be the guy looking at all the analytics. You have a, you know, let's say you got, most of you guys work on, you got a team of eight developers. Five of them got Macs, three of them got, have Windows. 
give the Windows guy the, the, li the, the live view because he needs it, right? That kind of thing. So people do that. So they do so. But How much does it cost? It goes from zero for everything. You can do anything except for the platform, basically everything here. Yeah. You can't get that for free. Once you go here and everything after, you go from zero to $1,000 per developer per month. And you have to buy five. Per month? Yep, and you have to buy five. Which means. Well, you're just an indie, so this is not for any developer. It is for indie developers, except for the platform. Oh. Yeah. We, we made our app with just Vecanian Studio. We never gave Accelerator a dollar. But we would pay for Live View, we would pay for the analytics, yeah. but not that much. <laughs> so basically, what you do is you say, Okay, I, I kind of want you know push notifications, or you know I kind of like this automated testing, you know I kind of like the analytics. Buy those individually, separately, somewhere else. Save yourself nine hundred dollars a month. You know what I mean? Most, most corporations have their own tracking. Yep. Uh, You're, a large corporation. I mean, we already had like of the five things we wanted, River, we had like three or four, and we went out and bought one more. No big deal. So that's what we did. And. Most of y'all are satellite in the US, but. Yep. Well, as a developer, we don't care about any of that, right? Huh? As a developer, we don't care about any of that. But it actually is really valuable. If uh, here's some references, this slide deck. Uh, luckily, no one ever customizes the Bitly link, so I got to use Accelerator. Okay, whatever. And that's case sensitive. Same with uh, App Flow chart there. That's another one of mine. For learning phone gap. Oh, I, I wanted to show you guys one more thing before you leave. If you're planning on ever doing titanium development and you're trying to learn it, all right, hold on, hold on. Okay, so I went out, right? And I was like, okay, I'm going to learn titanium development. Now I'm on a titanium contract. And I was like, I went on Amazon, I'm like, look at this tiny little book. It's, and, and it's only like five bucks. This is great. I'm going to learn this. And I read it, and it's the worst technical book I've ever heard in my life. Don't ever, ever get this stupid thing. It's horrible, just awful. Then I went online and actually did my real homework, right? And I said, okay, what are the, what's, what are the reviews say? What, can I, what should I buy? And I found this guy. Accelerator Titanium Application Development by Example. This one is very good. It kind of gives you a little hello world examples about everything you would ever want to do. You know, in five minutes, you can get, like, you know, Google Maps up, you know, geolocation. It, it, this one is pretty darn good. It's the best one on the market so far right now. There, if you ever, if anybody see Kevin Winery from Twilio earlier, like yesterday or something like that, he used to be like the number one evangelist for Titanium, and then he got a job at Twilio instead. He was replaced by a guy named Ricardo Alcosa. So if you're ever looking up Titanium stuff, you're going to run into the name of Ricardo Alcosa. He's working on a book right now with uh, Manny, with those weird pictures, you know, and that kind of thing. It's called Titanium Alloy in Action. I, I pre-ordered it and I was able to get a couple of, of chapters of it and that looks like it's going to be really good and that one I recommend first and foremost when it comes out. Until then, use this guy. Right? That's all I got for you. I'll leave these up.